what a difference just a few years can make. You may be wondering why I'm holding a mason jar with some water in it, but the difference was brought home to me just a little while ago. Will and I were talking about symbolism in this service, and I was asking him if he could use this as an object lesson with the children's sermon to help illustrate the way Herod felt when he heard about these magi. Because the word, and we'll come back to it in just a second, is paraso, or uh, tarasso, and it means, we translate it as frightened or disturbed, but it it actually also kind of means stirred up, mixed up. And so when I was thinking about that this week, I kept my mind kept going back to water, and I thought this would be a great children's sermon. Except it wouldn't, because this kind of a concept might go right over their heads. And that's the difference that a few years can make. Because just a few years ago, I would have been much more in touch with that concrete thinking that accompanies a children's sermon. And now I feel that I've lost touch with that. But this is a concept that I'm comfortable all of you can get. That this idea of being mixed up and stirred up and then calm again is one that that God can respond to in our lives. Keep that image in your mind. In the Netflix series, The Crown, there's a scene when the main character, Elizabeth, I'm not giving anything away at this point, first learns of the death of her father, King George VI of the United Kingdom. She and her husband, Philip, have been touring around in the colonies. And the news is a shock, because up to this point, we, the viewer, know her as a princess. We know that she will be the queen, because we know what the story is about, and she still is the queen, in fact. But no one really talks about it. And a doting assistant comes and, and tells her about the death of her father, King George. And he explains what will be happening next. They'll be traveling back to England immediately. He says there's press outside and, and she says, should I say something? She, and he says, no, though there is one matter that we should resolve right here and now. And that would help if you could decide on your name. She's puzzled. He explains that he means her regnal name, the, use, the name used by some monarchs and popes during their reigns. And then she says, well, let's not overcomplicate matters unnecessarily. My name is Elizabeth. She stands. And in that moment, something happens. Because when she stands, he also stands. You know, maybe from television or from your own study, that you don't remain seated in the presence of a king or queen. He immediately stands and says, Long live Queen Elizabeth. It's a profound moment. She is now the queen we, we have some sense of kings and queens from television or books or maybe even your own experience with royalty. We don't have that here in this country. But our culture has given us this sense of what royalty looks like. In Matthew chapter 2 verse 1, we first meet King Herod. And, and when we hear his name mentioned as Martha read in the time of King Herod, we, we fill in the gaps. I don't know if you did this, but I often would picture the royal fanfare, all the, the, the trumpets, obviously, if there's a king, there are trumpets also, and there are attendants and there are people serving him and bowing and genuflecting in other ways. We fill this all in. But the truth is, he had almost nothing in common with Queen Elizabeth. The Herod of this story it is Herod the Great. And the Great is a real misnomer for history. Yes, he had some public building projects. Yes, he sort of maintained peace, if you count brutal repression as peace. 
He punished the Pharisees who went against him, and he rewarded those who were kind to him. He killed 45 members of the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin and he confiscated their property so that he could pay his due to Rome. He was constantly in conflict with the Jewish high priests. Aristobulus was one who must have really run awry because he, he had him drowned and tried to make it look like an accident. He was a malevolent maniac who killed without remorse. He had his relatives, including his in-laws, a wife, and three sons all put to death. This is who the Magi encounter. Now, the Magi, we put in the mangers, but as Will pointed out, they came quite a bit later. They followed a star to find Jesus. They weren't really looking for him. They were following their astrological signs. A number of people throughout history have tried to make sense of this. What were they really doing? Was this some sort of strange phenomenon? In 1614, the German astronomer, uh, John Kepler attributed this star to an alignment of Jupiter and Saturn for the first leg of their journey. And then going to Bethlehem, he said it must have been a nova. But we don't know what they saw. We don't know what it could have looked like. Matthew 2.2 2 says they were astrologers from the east. That's about it. That's all we get from their biography. And they find this mad monarch, King Herod, and say, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? Okay, if you've followed who this Herod is, and you see the way he responds to those who are already committed to him, and you find this group of foreigners show up, come into the royal court with trumpets and fanfares and everything, and say, who's the new king? This can't possibly go well. The Bible says he's troubled, stirred up. And unlike this water, Unlike our souls, when we're troubled and stirred up and we turn ourselves over to God, the water calms down quickly. Herod didn't have that temperament. Herod stayed stirred up. It's unsettled when you're already paranoid and someone shows up and says, there's a new king. When it says Herod is stirred up or thrown into confusion, the problem is people die. When Herod is stirred up, all of Jerusalem is stirred up. Whether they're stirred up or not, they don't contradict their crazy king. Facing this maniac, the Magi ask, where's the child who's been born king of the Jews? He was supposed to be king of the Jews. He could have said, I'm king of the Jews, but he didn't. He concocted this evil plan and sent them on their way. When you find him, come back and tell me where he is so that I can also go and worship him. With these magi's action, the gospel of Jesus Christ suddenly breaks through a barrier that up to this point, this first chapter of Matthew has existed. Suddenly it's a message of good news for the whole world. Suddenly, this isn't just a limited message. These astrologers from the East, these foreigners, have shown up and all of a sudden broken through because they see what all of those who were watching could not see. Augustine wrote, Christ was not born because the star shone there, but the star was there because Christ was born. We shouldn't confuse connection with causality. And that's the point. Jesus' star shines figuratively or literally. It shines beyond the stables of his birth. It shines beyond the house where the Magi find him. It shines beyond King Herod. It shines beyond astrology, beyond his time and location. It shines throughout the years and it shines 
beyond politics or economics or national trends or whatever is going on. It shines, it shines beyond my problems. It shines beyond your problems. It shines beyond our worries and our fears and whatever dilemmas we encounter, whatever is happening right now, it shines. Through the mists of time, the star of Jesus still shines today. And in this story, we see Jesus bringing people together. By stating they're from the east, the Gospel of Matthew wants us to know they're not from here. They're not part of the people who were in the original story. They're strangers. And epiphany means the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. The message of Jesus is good news for them, just like it is good news for us. In this story, we see Jesus, even as an infant, troubling, where's my water? Troubling and stirring things up. He stirs up the powerful institutions. We, we don't have kings. Well, we don't have monarchs. But we have kings in our lives. They're not like the royalty on TV. They're not like Queen Elizabeth or King Herod. They're the things that we put above all others. They're those priorities that we have. Sometimes we can even make ourselves into the king of our lives. Herod was actually doing that. He wasn't just a king. He saw himself as king of the world. But these are the things that we listen to above all others. Some people are self-reliant, which is not entirely bad. I can do it, we declare. I've been guilty of this. That's Herod's problem. But then, just like Herod eventually learns that he cannot do everything, I learn that I cannot do it. I cannot do it all on my own. I need God and I need other people. I need the Magi to show up in my life and say, there's another way. There's a new king. And guess what? No, it's not you. The star of Jesus shines and leads us into communion with God. And suddenly we break away from idealism, materialism, hedonism, or sarcasm, or any other ism that serves to separate us from God. This is the power of that baby who started out in the manger. This is the power of that little boy who was sitting in a house when three strangers showed up. This is the power of the star of Jesus. And it can lead each one of us to a new place. When that baby came into the world, it wasn't the baby that King Herod was afraid of. It was God's authority giving kingship to God, someone other than himself. The Magi story is many things, but one of it is ironic. They weren't looking for the Messiah, yet they found him. The chief priests and the scribes were actively looking, but they missed him right in front of them. We can do that. When we think we found the answers, when we think we're in control, when we think we know what's coming next, when we feel like we're alone, when we feel like God has left us, when we feel like God isn't even paying attention to us. We miss the point of being a Christ follower. Stop what you're doing and look for the star. Pay attention to where God is leading. It might be something new and unfamiliar. It might be scary. Or it could be something very familiar. Something that seems old or even tired. Something that seems like, oh, that's the way they used to do church. We don't do it that way anymore. As is so often the case in the radical life of Jesus Christ, our expectations can be turned upside down when we open ourselves up. I invite you to join me in centering your life on Christ. So that when God speaks, we hear. When, when God shows a star or a sign, we see it. 
What did the Magi really see? I wasn't there. I, I didn't see it. But I do know they saw God. They experienced God in a real way, in a profound way. And I invite you to seek God with me. Seek not some sort of imagined version of God, not the God that fits in with our goals, but God incarnate, who most certainly and absolutely is troubling at times, but is always present and always leading us. Amen.